when was the dot-com bubble? I can't even remember when it was. That's a bad sign. Anyway. Wouldn't that have been around like 2003? Let me look it up before I say something totally silly. It shows how much I... I thought it was like... Yeah, 2003. Eight. Oh, okay, never mind. I'm just going to be quiet. <laughs> Shows how involved I was with that. <laughs> um, okay. All right. Let's go ahead and go live. For kids and others. And I think we had a few questions left over from last uh, week. Um, let's see, there was a question here. Where were you in the dot-com bubble burst? And uh was your wisdom needed then you know it, it takes me a moment to even remember when the dot-com bubble was um which is kind of a sign that it wasn't such a big deal for me so so i started my company wolfram research in 1986 which is an outrageous 34 years ago now um and uh we uh first released mathematica which is the kind of, uh, uh, which is the, the, the same story as Wolfram Language. We first released that in 1988 um, and uh, we've been developing it ever since. And we're about to bring out version 12.2 of it. Um, it seems like every new version we bring out, even these 0.1 versions um, are, uh, there's more and more and more stuff that ends up getting put in. It's kind of been an accelerating story for 34 years, which is a pretty long time to be accelerating for. But um, back around, I think the, the big run up of the dot com uh, bubble was kind of the first wave of, of uh, you know, the internet, it's cool, there's things going on, um, was the late 1990s up until about 2000, 2003. Uh, that period of time actually corresponded to a period of time when I was working on a basic science project. So I had, uh, uh, I started in 1991 um, working on this project, which turned into my book, A New Kind of Science, about exploring kind of the computational approach to understanding sort of everything in the world, so to speak, but particularly understanding the sort of computational universe of simple programs. Maybe I'll talk about that another time. But I, that would, turned out to be a project where I thought, gosh, I'm gonna spend a year or so on this, uh, along with running my company. Um, but it turned out I just discovered a lot more than I expected to discover. And that ended up being a, a 10 and a half year adventure, which finally finished in May 2002. So I finally released this book at that time. And then um, uh, at that time, my, my main uh, activity, in addition to running the company, um, was uh, uh, trying to explain to people what was in that book. Um, and um, so I'm not sure how much I even noticed the, the, the dot-com bust, so to speak, because I was, uh, our company uh, makes tools that get used by lots of people in R&D and now increasingly lots of people building production grade systems of various kinds. But um, uh, my theory tends to be when, when, um, when the world is in not so good shape, people are thinking more and that means they tend to use our tools that help people think more so we tend to be a little bit counter cyclical in terms of of, um, uh, of what happens with um, uh, with our tools. But for me, um, uh, 2003 or so, I was mostly explaining to people what new kind of science was about, and then I was gradually starting to realize that that on the basis of the the scientific ideas that I'd had there, that an idea that I'd actually been thinking about since I was a kid about computational knowledge was something that should be possible. And that turned into the building of Wolfram Alpha, which started around 2004 or so. 
so so I think at that at that period of time, my um, my main interest was uh, in making use of the science that I built, and then um, uh, and then transitioning to this project, which at first seemed like an absolutely impossible project, to making a system that could kind of uh, ingest the knowledge of the world, make it something that a computer could deal with, and make it so that a computer could answer questions on the basis of that. But that's what we. Uh, succeeded in in releasing in, in 2009 and now gets used um, all over the place. So I think the answer is that I I was um, surprisingly unaware of the of the dot com bubble and and bust um, because uh, the nature of our business I suppose is is uh, measured more on the multi decade time scale than it is on the individual what happens at a particular year time scale. Um, let's see. The um, oh boy, we got a, another history question here. Right, I'll do one more history question, and we'll go back and and um, do some other ones. This is from Parmenides. Um, what work did I do at Bell Labs? Who did I meet there? Gosh, you're asking me. You know, this is uh, usually I would be able to. I would go back and look in my archive and, and see things, but I'm going to I'm going to do this from memory, so it won't be quite as perfect as it might be. Um, but uh, um, I was back in 1983, um, right? Yeah, 1983. Um, and uh, uh, I was um, moving from Caltech to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And I spent a few months as a consultant at Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Uh, Bell Labs was the, the um, uh, the research center of AT&T, the, the sort of then not yet broken up phone company. And it was probably the most, the largest scale uh, research and development organization in the world at that time. Um, it was kind of the, 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 the side of the fact that the phone company was kind of a monopoly. Everybody had to get their phone from, from AT&T and it was, it was kind of, was kind of reminds one of some of the things that happened today with social media and so on, but it was kind of like, you can't, if, if even if you had a physical phone, physical phone that didn't come from AT&T, you were not allowed to plug it into the wires that, um, that AT&T had run to your house, so to speak. Uh, now, I think originally that was because they were worried that uh, if you plug the phone into the, the, their wires, you could just blow up their phone system. Or you could, for example, do things like you could uh, take electric power from the phone system um, and sort of bring the whole thing down and so on. And it used to be a very funky system because the electrical wires, you know, people have... So, so when, when you have a, um, uh, an electrical outlet you're getting in the US um, 220 volt uh, alternating current uh, electricity from that. Um, if, if you have a wired uh, phone, then most of the time when you're not talking on the phone or anything, there's, there's very little uh, electricity going through the wires that are, are the wires associated with your wired phone. Um, when uh, I think it's, uh, what is it, maybe 12 volts or something um, normally, but um, in, in, a, in something which is kind of a bizarre hack, and I don't know whether it still works this way, uh, when the phone would ring, you know, literally it would, it would have a little ringer thing and it would go, you know, would, would ring when, when you got a phone call, they put 100 volts through the phone line to get your phone to ring, so to speak. And, uh, you know, so, so I think one of the things they're worried about is, oh, my gosh, people will just take that 100 volts that they get for the phone ringing and so on and, and you know, use that to power. Yeah. I don't know what, but, but many reasons why, why one could imagine that would be kind of uh, um, uh, sort of bad news for people to just plug random things into the phone network. Um, but in any case, the result of, of all this was the phone system was kind of a, a complete monopoly and there was just one place in the U.S., where you get phones from. In many countries, the government ran the phone organization. Some countries still does. Um, and uh, there isn't a private phone, phone company, so to speak. But anyway, the, the sort of the benefit of the fact that uh, sort of all phones ran through AT&T was that AT&T had a huge budget for doing research and development, and they, they made a, a big effort to do that. And uh, the result of that effort was the invention of Transistor and uh, all sorts of other 
um, all sorts of other really important innovations um, in, uh, in the history of technology. But um, anyway, when I was there, um, it was sort of in the, in the probably still in the, in the golden age of, um, of Bell Labs. It was a very big building. I, I, I always used to think that they, they had these very straight corridors. I always used to think that the, the theory of it was, if anybody thought they could uh, compete, it's like, well, let us show you our research and development organization. You know, there's a corridor that um, goes so far, you can't even see to the other end of it. Um, but uh, it was, uh, they had spent a lot of effort trying to understand how to manage research and development well, and how to take people who were technically sophisticated and, and who had an interest in doing management and turn them into people who could do management and so on. A, I would say it was from what I could see, it was a pretty well-run organization. Um, the people, I, I interacted with kind of three groups of people there, physicists, mathematicians, and computer science people. The computer science folks were the Unix group. Unix, which is the operating system behind, uh, which is now Linux is, is uh, uh, sort of a clone of Unix. And uh, the Mac operating system, for example, also comes from a, a clone of Unix uh, that came out of Carnegie Mellon University, um, the operating system called Mark. Um, but uh, uh, back in the, um, in the early 1980s, Unix was still being developed at Bell Labs. Um, they, they, Unix was originally developed as a, an operating system to uh, uh, be run on telephone switching uh, uh, equipment. I mean, basically what happens in a, in a large, uh, you know, telephone wires come into this big place. And if somebody, if person A wants to call person B, fundamentally you have to get the, the, uh, the electrical signal that comes in on wire A, and somehow you have to get that electrical signal to go out on wire B. And so there have been a bunch of technologies for doing that. The earliest were kind of electromechanical switches where you literally... Uh, well, the, the, the very earliest were non-automated exchanges where people would have, where telephone operators would have this, this big plug board of, you know, you get a wire from person A, you're connecting it into a, a socket from, that goes to person B, and that's how you connect a phone call. And a lot of our, our language about connecting a phone call is really all about literally the operator pulling out the wire and putting it in the, in the place to, to make that connection. Then in the um, probably 1950s in the US, I think, um, 1940s to 1950s, uh, yeah, electromechanical switching. Actually, no, it had happened in the UK, for example. It had already happened by the time of the Second World War. There was already a bunch of electromechanical switching that was being done um, by the phone company um, in the UK and, and probably in the US also, um, where electromechanical switches were instead of uh, a human picking up the wire and connecting it somewhere, it was that something from the phone had told the switching equipment, oh, we're calling such and such a number. Um, so set the, the, uh, uh, set the system so that it would go, um, so that it would uh, uh, physically make a connection from this place to that place by, by moving relays, by, by having electrical signals that move relays that then make the connection uh, from person A to person B. And I think, um, uh, I don't know whether uh, I'm, this is the, the, the difficulty of the fact that I grew up in England a long time ago, and um, I, I'm not sure I've used these terms since I lived there, so I don't completely know if the American terms are the same, but there was this notion of standard trunk dialing. So one of the issues was when you make a local call, if you're in your very local area, that really that could be achieved by having you know a phone operator basically uh, you know they just have a big switchboard of uh, here here are all the subscribers you know a few thousand of them here are, and you literally put a wire from one to another but clearly if you're doing that for the whole country or the whole world that's that's absolutely not possible and so the idea was that there would be these trunk lines where from the local phone exchange you would then connect to a trunk line, which would be a long line that would go from you know, New York to, to San Francisco or something. Then at the other end, a phone operator would kind of pick up uh, that, that would, would take that, that wire and kind of connect it to, um, uh, to, to the particular person you were calling. So, um, uh, but, but the, so the first step was to automate, the, um, uh, automate different stages of this and to automate um, 
uh, what you sent over the over the kind of long distance phone line to tell the operator at the other end what to connect to and and all those kinds of things and and that kind of stuff gradually came in I think in the 1940s 1950s um, and so on. By the time I was around in England in the 1960s, I think pretty much all of the local exchanges there were no humans involved. It was all electromechanical switching equipment. But then there was a new idea. The new idea was to use computers to do switching, and um, the uh, one of the ideas was to use uh, so-called virtual circuits where you would do things like you would have um, essentially, I mean, this was sort of the early days of things like computer networks, like ethernet and things like this, but it was long before ethernet. Um, it was ideas like, uh, you know, you would sort of put all the data into this one electrical bus where essentially wire, and you would do things like you would say, okay, you get the time slot between uh, you break all times up into let's say a thousandth of a second, you get the first thousandth of a thousandth of a second and you compress all your data and put it there. And that represents the conversation for a, a thousandth of a second or something. And then you say, okay, person A uh, to communicate with person B, they're gonna pick time slot 27. And they both know that they're dealing with time slot 27. And so the data from everybody is thrown onto the same bus but person B knows and person A both know they're taking that particular time slot out of, out of these various slices of time um, that, that are made available. So that was kind of an idea and, and there were subsequent ideas, but the big thing that, um, that happened uh, around um, late 1960s, 1970 or so, was the idea of really using computers, general purpose computers to control all that switching uh, capability. And so Unix was developed as a, an operating system for computers to enable that kind of switching to be done. And it was originally developed really just to run on telephone switching equipment. But then it was realized that actually it can be used for lots of other things. And, and Bell Labs pretty much said, well, we'll just give it away to use for other things. We don't really care about other things. We only care about the, the Unix RT, the real time version of Unix that was gonna be used for telephone switches. Um, but uh, I remember when I was there, the, uh, well, so, so as I recall, there were these series of generations of uh, ESSs, electronic switching system uh, things. And I, I think, I think um, in a rough approximation, you know, there would be the number four ESS, number five, number six, number seven. And I think roughly they were going up in factors of 10 in size. And so by the time you were dealing with the New York City central switching system, you know, it was switching 10 million lines or something, and it would be a number seven one or whatever. I think it was also in generations of, of when those devices were produced. I don't, I don't recall all the details of it. But I do remember when I was, when I was there, there had been, um, uh, I think it was when I was there, maybe it was slightly before that, I'm not sure. Um, there had been a, uh, uh, some kind of strike or something among the people who worked in the telephone switching uh, uh, facility in, in New York City, for example. And um, the, the researchers at Bell Labs were very keen. They were like, oh my gosh, we're gonna get to go into this actual you know, closed building that is the central telephone switch because something might go wrong. But actually the, the, the equipment was built with a lot of redundancy. And I think over a few week period, simply nothing failed. Um, or if, it, if, if things failed, there was enough redundancy that another device was sort of automatically put into, to, into operation um, and no human had to be involved in going in and replacing anything. Um, but uh, that was a time when, when um, well, the Unix operating system, uh, um, uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie were the two people who had been involved in, in building that. And I certainly knew both of those people. Um, and uh, the, um, I think uh, they'd also been involved in um, the C programming language um, and Brian Cunnigan and, uh, was a person who was also at Bell Labs at that time and uh, wrote a, uh, the nice sort of early book on, um, on the C programming language along with Dennis Ritchie. I mean, kind of the, and again, I'm now going into history, which is probably not for the young, but, but anyway, I mean, um, but it's sort of interesting that Dennis Ritchie had done a PhD in theoretical computer science um, before he had uh, come to Bell Labs. I think he worked on registers register machines actually, which strangely sort of resonate with the kind of thinking that goes into the C programming language. Um, but, uh, oh gosh, who are all, all sorts of other people I, I uh, knew at Bell Labs, both people in the, in the kind of Unix area 
um, and uh, people who were involved with kind of, um, uh, you know, early computer security stuff. Like I remember Ken Thompson talking about how, um, uh, how he just called up a bunch of um, um, people who had Unix systems and said, uh, you know, on the phone, hello, I'm Ken Thompson. You know, can you tell me the, the, um, the root password for your system? And a bunch of them did. And that was kind of an early experiment in kind of social engineering for computer security, because obviously that was a super bad idea. If somebody just calls you on the phone and says, what's the root password for your computer system? It's like really bad idea in general to, to, to give the answer to that. Um, but it was sort of interesting that he, he tried that experiment um, just to see what would happen. Um, but uh, yeah, lo lo lots of other people I could tell you about math people and physics people, but I think this is, this is too much in the category of, of um, uh, of history, um, and uh, uh, yeah. So my own my own uh, work at Bell Labs was mostly mostly um, uh, I was working on cellular automata and mathematical kinds of things. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, There's a question here from D0. Was it need in the phone grid that drove innovation of the transistor? I, I believe the answer to that is yes. I believe that transistors were, so, so what was there before transistors? There were, uh, there were electromechanical switches, but then there were purely electronic switches that were based on vacuum tubes. And so what is a vacuum tube? It's this thing, usually they're quite big. They're, you know, these glass, um, in, in British English, they used to be called valves. In American English, they're called vacuum tubes. Um, they, they're, they're glass with a vacuum inside. And um, they, the most common kind was a thing called a triode. And a triode, um, the idea was that in a vacuum, when you heat a wire up, eventually it will start uh, emitting electrons. When you heat the wire up, eventually there, there's a sort of a stream of electrons that get produced. and What's happening is in this in this triode device is that you are getting the stream of electrons and you have sort of a, 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 a mesh that they have to go through. And depending on whether there's a voltage on that mesh or not, they'll either go through or they won't. And that's a way to make essentially an electrical switch um, using those kinds of techniques. But the way that you had to make that electrical switch involved having this, this glass thing that was had vacuum inside and it was quite big and it it operated with quite high voltages of hundreds of uh, actually even even thousands of volts in the end and there were things that got hot and it was it was just a big mess and the uh the mean time between failures uh was quite short and things would um you know uh, the, the what would happen is you know the hot wire would get so hot that it would, it would get some defect and it would then it would break and all kinds of different things would happen and so it was kind of unreliable, and these vacuum tubes are very expensive to produce. Um, so there was a big push. Is there a way of doing switching that does not use this, you know, really kind of complicated piece of physics and complicated thing? And so the transistor uses semiconductors, and transistors can be very, very, very small. I mean, they can be made in the um, uh, uh, down to um, um, uh, millionths of a meter. Um, the, the length scales now are on the order of um, six-ish millionths of a meter is kind of the, the feature size. Well, actually, the feature size for a transistor is a little bigger than that, but it's, 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 um, uh, it's like one hundred thousandth of a meter um, is, is a typical kind of uh, size of a transistor as it appears on a, on a microprocessor uh, integrated circuit chip or something. So they can be made very, very small. The, the early transistors weren't that small. They were, they were, you know, they would usually maybe be a centimeter across, but but they also nothing, there wasn't anything that got hot inside. There was nothing that had to have a vacuum inside. It was just something you made out of semiconductors. And um, uh, it was a, a, a pure sort of solid state device. There was no vacuum in it. There was nothing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a much, much better way to do electronic switching. Now people have wondered, um, ever since the, um, the invention of the transistor, is there yet a better way to do it? And for example, one thing, there's a thing called the memristor, which is another kind of approach. There are ideas that are based on kind of quantum scale devices 
that are possible transistor-like things, the, these things called Josephson junctions, which were one thing that um, uh, was popular at a time and, and is now used in, in some designs of quantum computers. Josephson junctions are, are very cool in two senses of the word, both they're an interesting idea and they have to be cooled to the temperature of liquid helium in order to work. Um, they work using this phenomenon called superconductivity um, that uh, I can explain that. I mean, basically, actually superconductivity, the theory of how superconductivity worked was another thing that was uh, developed, um, I guess that was developed at Bell Labs. Um, the, uh, anyway, the, the uh, okay, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but, but perhaps interesting to people. What is a superconductor? So, so normally, in, um, when you have a, um, uh, a piece of wire, for example, and you're trying to uh, put an electric current through it, what does it mean to put an electric current through it? It means there are electrons that you're sort of at one end of the wire, you're kind of progressively pushing electrons through the wire. The electrons will, will, um, uh, will be moved through the wire. The electric... Uh, the voltage is the kind of force that pushes the electrons. The current is the number of electrons that are flowing through the wire. And the res re resistance of the wire is the kind of how much force you have to put in order to get a certain amount of current, in order to get a certain flow of electrons through the wire. And so any material will have a certain resistivity, a certain amount of resistance per unit volume, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so any particular material will have that Resistivity. Resistivity is varied by huge amounts, by factors of a trillion between different kinds of materials. So there are insulators where it's super difficult. You have to put, you know, uh, millions of volts across a thing before it will usually break down the material to get um, uh, to get current to go through it, to get electrons to go through it. And then there are other materials, metals typically, where electrons just wander around very freely, and you don't need to put a lot of voltage on to get the current to flow through the, the material. And so those, those things have low resistivity. Metals have low resistivity, but they still have some resistivity. So if you have a copper wire, for example, copper is a, is a metal that's a good electrical conductor. If you have a copper wire, um, then you can put a certain voltage on it. Let's say you put um, uh, 220 volts, for example, on it. It's like how long a, a copper wire, uh, you know, what is the resistance of a copper wire? How much uh, how long a copper wire can you have while still getting a certain flow of electrons, a certain current through it based on a voltage of let's say 220 volts. Now, by the way, you can have longer and longer lengths of copper wire and still get current through it, the higher the voltage you have. And that's why, for example, when you see power lines that are going a long distance, they have higher voltages um, because that, that's a, a way to, um, uh, to sort of get more current through the wires um, and actually, there are some some other effects that I'm not uh, that I'm ignoring slightly here about about um, heat dissipation and so on. But but let's ignore that for for now. But the basic point is that in in all materials like copper, there's a certain to uh, there's a certain resistance. There's a certain resistivity to the material. Okay, so back around 1910 or so, uh, it was discovered that if you make a metal, um, I think. Uh, Niobium, tin, I think these were the fir first ones that were discovered, if I remember correctly. If you make these metals really, really cold, then it turns out that a strange thing happens. Instead of them, their, their resistance goes down and down and down, and then suddenly the resistance goes to zero. Like there's no resistance. You can, you just have to, any electron, as soon as you get it started, it'll just go freely through the material. And so that, um, that it's, it's like, when, you know, when something like water uh, uh, freezes into ice, there's a phase transition, suddenly at a temperature of let's say zero degrees centigrade, um, the water, you know, any liquid water will freeze into ice. Similarly with a superconductor, um, you have a, a transition at a certain temperature at which the superconductor, instead of having a, a certain resistance, a certain resistivity will go to zero resistance. Um, and so a superconductor has this feature that if you have something at that lower temperature, these are temperatures close to absolute zero. So temperature is determined by kind of the, the how fast atoms in a material are running around, how much kinetic energy is there associated with the atoms in a material, that's what determines temperature. So that means as you, as you make the temperature lower and lower and lower, the atoms get slower and slower and slower until eventually, essentially the atoms have stopped 
at absolute zero, absolute zero is minus 273.16 or something degrees centigrade. Um, uh, uh, they don't quite stop because of quantum effects, but in a first approximation, there's no more, the, 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 the atoms are just sort of stationary. They're not running around, which is what temperature makes them do. Um, I, I, again, footnote, they're not, it's not quite true because of, because of quantum zero point energy, which makes them not quite be stationary, but they're as stationary as they'll ever get. So in any case, what happens is in a superconductor, um, below a certain temperature, the, um, uh, you, get, um, a, uh, uh, you get this transition to uh, any voltage will successfully push electrons through the material. So that means you can, if you have a superconducting, a ring of superconductor, you can actually have electric current circulate on that ring for months, years even. People have done that. If you keep the thing cold enough, there's just no resistance to those electrons just keeping on circulating. Normally what will happen in a, in a material is the electrons will be going through it and they'll keep on hitting imperfections in the material. And those imperfections in the material will deflect the electrons effectively and stop them just going the direction the voltage said they should go. But at, at, when you make the temperature cold enough in a superconductor, roughly, that's not what happens. Roughly, there are the, the, um, the number of sort of imperfections gets small enough that um, there isn't sort of resistance to motion of the electrons. Actually, the true story is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, the true story is that um, in a superconductor, it's a quantum mechanical effect that allows, um, okay, it's a little complicated. There are these things that are called Cooper pairs that are formed, which are pairs of electrons. And these pairs of electrons uh, have the property that they have, a, they're quantum mechanically, things called bosons, um, which means that they have the quantum mechanical feature that they all sort of want to get together in the same state. Once you have some electrons, some electron pairs that are, um, that all sort of want to go in a particular direction, more electrons will want to join that pack. That's a feature of the quantum mechanics of, of particles like that, um, is that they'll all sort of want to join the pack and go in the same direction. The other big phenomenon that works the same way is lasers. Lasers involve photons, particles of light, that want to sort of have this feature that they're bosons and they like to get together and all go in a pack. And that's kind of why you get sort of this coherent beam of laser light. In a superconductor, what's happening is you're essentially getting a coherent uh, uh, sort of herd of electrons, uh, not quite a beam of electrons because it's, it's inside a material, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but a coherent um, sort of a coherent collection of electrons that all sort of want to do the same thing and all kind of support each other in keeping on maintaining that electric current and not letting it get uh, deflected away and so on. So anyway, superconductors um, are, um, uh, uh, so, so one feature of superconductors is they have, um, uh, they have these currents, persistent currents. There are also some features of superconductors that have to do with magnetic field. And that's, I was talking about Josephson junctions, that's how they work and they involve, oh, <sighs> I, this is going to get me too far afield. Uh, uh, quantization of magnetic field um, in in loops of superconductor and so on. I mean, just on the subject of superconductors, one of the big issues is, okay, people use superconducting magnets. Uh, okay, people, you can make a bigger magnet if you can have if you can use a superconductor to just maintain this very high uh, current, which produces a large magnetic field. And so, some MRI machines, for example, that want to have very large magnetic fields. We'll use superconductors and we'll have uh, magnets that are co co uh, cooled to very low temperatures. One of the things that's been a long running effort is can one make a room temperature superconductor? Can one make a superconductor that one could like use to make a magnetically levitated train or something like this? Can one have a superconductor that is still superconducting at room temperature? Because the superconductors we know are superconducting, you know, a few degrees above absolute zero, uh, at temperatures where where certainly air is liquid, um, but actually more than that, helium, which is is one of the the last to, to liquefy substances. Um, you have liquid helium, and um, uh, that's what you use actually as a coolant typically for for superconductors. And the question is, can one get room temperature superconductors? Nobody's succeeded in doing that. About uh, thirty years ago now so-called high temperature superconductors were found, which are materials that make it to, what is it, tens of, of, of degrees above absolute zero. And, um, the, uh, and that, those, those are quite um, 
uh, slightly exotic materials, and, and it's still not really understood exactly how high temperature superconductivity works. It wasn't known at the beginning. When superconductivity was discovered, it took a solid 50 years, 40 years, 50 years, um, between the time when superconductivity was discovered as a phenomenon to the time when it was explained theoretically. And high temperature superconductors, still one doesn't know. And so one doesn't really know if there's some strange substance that um, if one could only figure it out, would suddenly make high temperature, room temperature superconductors. And then we would have all these devices we have would suddenly have superconductors in them. And that would be pretty cool. And there are all kinds of interesting things that one could do that way. All kinds of useful things for electric power distribution, all kinds of things for, for lots of different purposes. Um, the, uh, in fact, the, the high temperature superconductors that are known now are somewhat exotic materials. For example, one of the things that uh, a chemical element lanthanum was one that is not used for very many things, but it was that's an element that appeared in the at least in the early high temperature superconductors. Um, so I think we're we're way off topic because we were talking about some. Um, uh, gosh, we we're talking about some. Um, um, uh, I don't know how did I get into this. We were talking about some um, oh uh, transistors and switching networks and so on and. Um, and that's just a, a different direction is if you could get, if superconductors were easy to have, there would be a bunch of new kind of switching stuff that, that would be possible. Um, let's see. Uh, that's a question from Philip here. How many shirts do I own? That's a good question. I was, I wonder about that something. I don't know. It's not, it's on the, uh, uh, by physicist orders of magnitude, it's of, of order tens by which I, I, I think. Um, certainly not. Um, um, and the question is, do I wear a different shirt every time I do one of these um, um, one of these um, episodes? I, I, I have no idea. I have not. Um, that's a piece of data analytics that will be easy to do based on looking at the YouTube videos or whatever. Um, uh, will be will be easy thing to do in Wolfram language. I haven't done it. I guess I'm not that interested in that. Um, uh, oh yeah, the the. Let's see. Um, well, there are lots of questions here, lots of interesting things. There's a question from David here. Are there string theorists who believe that nature is finite and digital? You know, that's one of those questions which couldn't possibly be answerable by, because I don't know how many string theorists there are in the world. I, I would guess the number is, hmm. Active string theorists, probably a few hundred, um, maybe as many as a thousand, but I would guess it's in the few hundred. Uh, it's probably a, it's it's a, you know it's a decreasing number, and you know do any of them believe something is not a question that one is going to be able to answer. Um, do I? Well, I suppose one might be able to by by saying, um, uh, do I know ones who believe that? I, I'm pretty sure I do, um, and uh, in fact, there's a. There's a, a workshop next week, which has kind of been, been um, uh, stimulated by our physics project that involves mostly causal set and loop quantum gravity people, not, I think, string theorists, but, but maybe, maybe we'll learn something there about what, what people think. It's, it's hard to know. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, gosh, so many questions here. Um, Okay, this is an interesting question from Mikhail. It says, great scientists typically have great students. Is it because something is transferred from a teacher to a student or because talented people try to reach outstanding supervisors? That is a good question. Um, it's probably a mixture of those things. I think that, well, let me, let me describe a couple of points. Uh, you know, when one has been successful in a project, it's easier to be successful in another project. So if somebody has, uh, if one has somehow gotten involved in a project that is successful and that one is successful in, that tends to give one the confidence to go on and try other projects that one can be successful in as well. So I think that's a, if, if somebody happened to be, happens to be sort of close to something great that's happening, then that's a, that's a good indicator that they'll be able to go on doing great things. I mean, I, I, I might say that, that you know, I, I have been, I, I, I'm not been uh, an academic or professor for, how long is it? 
33 years now, a third of a century. That's disgustingly long. But um, so I can, um, um, but I would say that, um, uh, you know, there are people who are great researchers and pretty crummy supervisors of students. And there are people who are not particularly great researchers, but outstanding supervisors of students. These are two sort of independent parameters. And sometimes it varies. It depends on what stage of a career somebody is at. You know, they may be at a stage in their career where they're really concerned with their own research and they just don't want to take any time interacting with students. Um, it's, uh, um, and, um, you know, there's also a, sort of a complicated trade off because there are people where they'll say they'll, uh, they want students who are going to help them do their own research project. If their own research project is super interesting and the sort of spin off, one of the students gets kind of a spin off of that project and that, you know, and the whole project is so interesting, it kind of everybody wins. But the other possibility is, well, actually the, 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 the research project isn't that interesting and the student is kind of uh, pulled along on a not, ter not terribly interesting project and they don't get to, you know, use their own wings, so to speak, and make their own project. Whereas in other cases, you know, students will invent their own project and sometimes they'll have a hard time finding an, an advisor who says, oh yeah, I'm interested in, in helping you with that project or, or supervising you on that project. And sometimes there are, there are very sort of structural issues like somebody, some advisor will have a, a government grant that pays for research in a particular area. And unless a student is, wants to work in that particular area, it's like, well, I'm sorry, I can't support you from this, from this grant that I have. So there are sort of mechanical things like that that happen. But um, I would say that the, um, um, uh, you know, in terms of the, the do, it's a little complicated because there are things where there are places where there's sort of a hotbed of some particular hot area that's going on and, and people, students will tend to, uh, you know, if they're, if they're sort of ambitious for that area, they'll try and go to those places. And so they'll tend to be aligned with kind of the, all the activity that's happening there. And that, that makes them more likely to, to do things that are, that are seen as exciting. I think that, um, uh, but, but, you know, it, it's a very, um, um, it's such a personality dependent thing. I mean, there are people, uh, you know, I, I always noticed that, um, uh, you know, there are areas which are very fashionable where if you work in that area and uh, you make a progress in research in that area, um, people will immediately say, if you made progress, they say, oh yeah, we all know about this area. We know why it's important. And yeah, you, what you did is great or not great or whatever. That's the good news about working in a fashionable area. The bad news is there are lots of other people working in that area too. And you're in a sense competing in this race with lots of other people to pick kind of whatever low hanging fruit or whatever things are possible in that area. So it's kind of the fashionable area case of, you know, and then there's the unfashionable area case where nobody is going to, you know, there, there are no competitors. It's, a, it's an open thing, there's no race. But then if you figure out something you think is really, really interesting, then you've, got a, then you've got a whole battle of telling people, look, this thing you've never heard about before, this is really interesting. Personally, I'm much, I'm much more interested in the kind of unfashionable areas um, uh, thing, partly because I feel like uh, from a sort of, perhaps it's an egotistical point of view, I feel like I'm making more of a contribution if I'm doing something that wouldn't have been done if I hadn't done it. Whereas if I'm part of a race where lots of people are trying to do the same thing. It's like, well, if I don't do it, somebody else in the race will do it, will do it instead. So what am I really contributing? Um, but that's another thing that's that's complicated and, and has some sort of complicated consequences for, for students and, um, uh, and so on. I mean, you know, another thing to understand about, for example, graduate students is, uh, you know, a minority of graduate students invent their own projects to do for their PhD theses or whatever. The majority are given a project by somebody and the choice of project is a difficult matter. And some, uh, some people are much better at, at figuring out potential projects than others. And some people provide much more fertile projects for students to work on. I mean, I, it happens, I, I, we run the summer school and, and high school summer camp every year. And one of my jobs there is to come up with projects for everybody. And I'm, I'm pretty pleased with myself these days for, you know, for the projects that I managed to come up with. And I, I was actually just, um, 
just noticing that a person who was at our summer school, um, uh, what was it, 18 years ago or something now, uh, was a project that I suggested that he turned into a paper and many papers and our whole career. And I just noticed he's just becoming a senior professor somewhere, um, uh, sort of go, uh, going in that direction. So that was, I thought that was, I was, I was pretty happy about that. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, it's a, it's, um, it's quite an art to come up with a good project. And to be able to do that for oneself is a, is a major skill. Uh, it's a skill that typically does not exist in people who are uh, sort of just going to graduate school. When it does exist, it's great. Well, it's great so long as the project you really want to do is a project that you can find an advisor who says, oh yeah, I'm happy to work with you on that project rather than, oh, well, I can't really support you on that project because my grant does this and I'm really only interested in that and I really want you to be kind of a research assistant for my project type thing. So it's it's a bit of a... Um, a bit of a complicated story there. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think that um, in terms of, um, um, well, there's another phenomenon which happens in sort of the education, particularly in the kind of high achieving researchy end of things, which is just seeing that other people invent something and do something that becomes, you know, that's, that's sort of highly visible in the world, just seeing something go from nothing to something is extremely educational, so to speak. Or just knowing that, uh, I don't know, when, when, I was, when I was a kid, I was studying physics and things, and, and you know, I, I knew all these names of all these physicists and so on. And then a few years later, when I was a late teenager, actually, I, well, mid to late teenager, I started meeting these people. And it's like, you know, before that had just been a name of some, you know, some famous name of some invented, who invented some physics thing or whatever else. And then it was very interesting to kind of get to know these people as people and to realize, yeah, well, these are just people too. And, you know, they get some things right, they get some things wrong. There's nothing, you know, magic and sort of uh, offered a distance about what's going on there. It's something that, you know, I can imagine doing it too. And if you're around some uh, something where somebody, even somebody else, is going for, well, I have this crazy idea, and then you hear about it being developed, and then suddenly it's this big thing in the world. That's a neat thing to see. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have done that process of going from, that's, a, you know, the crazy idea that I come up with to something that's a, a big thing in the world, so to speak. I've had the good fortune to do that a bunch of times in my life. And uh, I always think it's nice when other people are kind of involved or at least can sort of seeing what's going on, because I think it is really quite empowering to see this process of going from, I just have an idea to this is a thing that's a real thing in the world that uh, people are making use of. Um. Gosh, so many questions here. It's taking me even. Um, um, okay, there's a question here from Mr. Wololo. Can't quite read it, but anyway. What age do you think is the best age to start coding and why? So it's a good question. Uh, you know, I think the most important thing to learn for most people is how to think computationally. It's more important than the mechanics of how to write a piece of code or whatever else. Um, and, uh, you know, I've spent a large part of my life trying to build this computational language that we have that tries to make it as easy as possible for us humans to express ourselves computationally and get our computers to do things. That, that particular activity is a bit different from the typical kind of programming language, uh, you know, C, Java, Python, whatever programming language activity, which is let me talk to a computer in its own language and get the computer to do things that computers intrinsically do. Um, what we're interested in in Wolfram language and in making a sort of full-scale computational language is to be able to talk to a computer about 
I don't know, cities or movies or whatever else and have the computer already know lots of stuff about cities and movies and how to compute lots of things and how to make, uh, you know, uh, process images in this way and that way and the other. And in other words, have something where there's sort of computational intelligence built into the computer and where our challenge is to use computational language to express ourselves to our computer so that the computer can use its computational intelligence to give us back things we want to know about. And so, you know, I think the, the um, to me, learning computational language, learning to express oneself computationally, learning to, to think about things in a way that can be explained to a sufficiently smart computer, that's the thing that pretty much 100% of people should know how to do. That's the computational literacy that people need. That's the, that's the analog of the sort of basic mathematical literacy that people need. It's the analog of, of literacy in, uh, uh, in, in, in writing in natural language, in English or whatever else that people need. Um, that's the thing people need. Being able to write low level computer code where you know how to, how to allocate memory and define loops and, and uh, uh, you know, check pointers and things like this that's a very small fraction of people that need that. Um, that's, that's for the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the sophisticated low level engineers, um, uh, low level in the sense that they're dealing with sort of the infrastructure of the world way below what most people need to worry about. Most people, you know, are going to just use a cell phone. They don't need to know the packet structure of, you know, how, um, uh, how data is sent on, on, you know, through a cell phone network and how, the, uh, uh, how all that stuff works. And most people, you know, who drive cars, for example, you know, the number of people who need to know how the car engine works and how to change, uh, even these days, how to change a tire or something is, is gone down and down. Um, that stuff has been sort of automated away. What you need to know is the part that is sort of the human goal of which way do I want to car drive the car? What, what do I do with the, you know, what do I want to do with the car, so to speak, rather than, you know, what is the low level operation of the car in its sort of internal engineering? So I think the, the important thing is learning this kind of computational thinking. How do you express yourself in terms of computational thinking? And um, my observation is, you know, I, I wrote this little book called Elementary Introduction to Wolfram Language. And I did that partly on the basis of, um, uh, I, for quite a few years now, I've, I've um, had sort of a hobby of trying to teach actual kids uh, sort of computational thinking kinds of things. Um, and uh, that's, that's a good hobby if you're interested in kind of uh, presenting kind of computational thinking education to the world, because you quickly with kids get to know, you know, is what you're doing actually sensible or not? Um, and uh, I think that the... Um, uh, that's that sort of gradually helped me to to, uh, to 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 sort of sharpen the exposition and um, and the things that one can do. But basically, my observation is, I think around age ten or eleven seems to be the age at which kids. So so that's an age at which kids can type uh, on a computer these days. Um, they don't have trouble, kind of um, uh, you know, with the sort of mechanics of doing that. And then it's also a thing that teachers often think is, oh my gosh, the kid is going to have to learn the syntax for expressing themselves to the computer. Well, actually, kids don't have much trouble with that, particularly because, you know, in our systems, for example, we are giving many affordances. We're, we're, we're helping, you know, we have auto-completion, we have color coding, uh, you know, uh, syntax coloring, we have all kinds of things that kind of give one, and we're actually going to have more and more of that, that kind of give one feedback. So it's like a, a super version of a spell checker um, because it knows a lot more about the, 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 the meaning of what you're trying to say. So it's able to give a lot more information as feedback. So I think age around age 10 or 11, kids don't seem to have trouble with the mechanics of sort of entering things. And I think what happens then is what's really important is that the first things they do with kind of computational language actually do something they find interesting. You know, do something with colors, with sounds, with maps, with things like this you know, saying write a loop that generates, uh, you know, I don't know, prime numbers or something is, well, that might be interesting to some kids, but it's, I would say that's not, uh, you know, that's not top of the list in terms of, of really engaging with things. And, and the, the sort of the richness of actually doing computational thinking about real things in the world is, is very, very great. And I think that's, that's sort of the place to start. And I think that age is a, is a pretty decent age to start at. Now, it's an interesting question. As things get more more streamlined, you know, at one stage, it's just like saying, okay, you learn how to, 
take an image and do some, you know, blur the image, change the colors in the image. That's all pretty straightforward. Maybe you learn how to make a table of, of things and so on. That's all pretty straightforward. By the time you're doing more sophisticated kind of transformations on data, um, by the time you're doing more sophisticated operations, uh, you know, what does that ramp look like? Um, that's kind of an interesting thing. And I, I don't think I know all the answers to that. Actually, let me, let me make another point, which is people sometimes say, well, let's get started with programming, you know, uh, uh, coding, whatever, computational thinking, whatever, much earlier than age 10. Well, I think that was more important in the past than it is today. Because the truth is today, most kids, unless they've been sort of, uh, uh, you know, forced away from technology, um, or for some reason, you really, really don't have access to technology. You know, they've used uh, all kinds of user interfaces, all kinds of games and so on, which have those kinds of basic sort of algorithmic common sense thinking. They're already doing those things. I mean, in the past, there were things like Logo and Scratch and so on, which were kind of junior computer languages that were intended for, for kids to kind of... Um, uh, get some experience with having computers do things. And at the time when Logo was developed, for example, in the 1960s, it was spectacular because the idea that a kid could walk up to a computer and get the computer to do something was a really new idea and a really important idea and, and really something empowering to kids to see. But to, in today's world, every kid knows they can get a computer to do stuff. And the question is, can they get a computer to do things that are sort of interesting to them I think that uh, you know sometimes you know you can you can certainly use Scratch to make animations things like that which are which are kind of fun and and that's not a bad thing to do um, but uh, in terms of learning sort of uh, that's a fine thing to do to just make things with it but in terms of of really learning something fundamental about computational thinking I don't really see that that's helping much over what one ambiently gets from just experience with with the sort of the typical user interfaces and computers that just exist today. Um, I think the real place where you start really engaging with sort of the, the computational thinking literacy is when you're really actually using computational language and really telling the computer to do something. And what's, what's really neat is that, you know, in, in the effort that we've made to build Wolfram language and so on, it's, uh, we, you know, we've, we've gone to all this effort to sort of automate things to the point where it's, it's easy enough to use that sort of the world's most advanced researchers and so on can use it to, to do things which are sort of on the frontier. But it also turns out that that sort of ease is also what makes kids have it, find it accessible. So I, you know, anyway, my, my, my basic answer is age 10 or 11 is, is sort of the place where that seems to be, seems to start to be, to be realistic. Now, you know, as one gets to more complicated concepts, you know, does that require greater age? It's a really interesting question. So, so one of my favorite examples is higher order functions or um, uh, things like uh, lambdas or uh, uh, what we call an, um, uh, what we call pure functions, um, things where you have a a whole sort of um, uh, you have a whole construction that is being applied to data, uh, where the where the construction where you're treating a program as a piece of data and you're sort of building up this program as a piece of data and then applying it to data and so on. That's a concept that in my experience, people don't find that easy to get. And it takes maybe on average being a bit older for people to really get that concept. I mean, I think it's like you can in principle teach calculus to a, you know, to a 10 year old, but it's actually a bit difficult because some of the concepts are a bit abstract and tend to, for whatever reason, us humans are not, uh, don't seem to be very well wired when we're really young to deal with, with very abstract concepts. At least that's the way it seems. I mean, there've certainly been theories about education that say that that's the case. I don't know really how accurate those theories are. I certainly asked the person who invented Logo, for example, who had sort of the earliest and longest running experience, whether he had a sense of, of, um, of when kids get to understand concepts like recursion and so on, he didn't really. And I don't, I don't know whether that's, um, but my, my anecdotal impression is that uh, it's a few years older than that, that people start to, um, uh, to be able to get those things easily. And I, I think the thing that one has to understand is, is often we've seen a lot of examples of not using these fancy kind of higher order approaches. Often we've seen a bunch of those examples and one's had to do a bit of extra typing 
and so on, because one isn't using these fancier things, then one is sort of primed once one sees the fancier thing to say, aha, now I can see there's a really good labor saving device. If you try and feed that kind of fancy thing to people at the beginning, they'll be like, why do I care about this weird abstract thing? I don't understand what the point is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's, that's my feeling is, and, you know, I will also say on the other end, okay, on the other end, it's like, is there an oldest age at which you can learn computational thinking and computational language? I think the answer to that is definitively no. And I, I, I was very charmed a few years ago. I, um, you know, people occasionally send me uh, uh, sort of uh, technical support questions about our language. And um, I, I'm not the best place to send them by any means because we have a whole infrastructure for answering people's questions. But, but I get one of these things from somebody and um, I'm um, some question and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm kind of about to send it along to, to technical support when I notice that the person says, and I want to use this for a presentation that I'm going to give at my hundredth birthday party. So um, that got my attention and uh, turned out to be a, uh, uh, distinguished oceanographer, actually, who 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 died of, uh, at the age of maybe 101 or 102, but um, uh, but it was I was very charmed that that um, uh, you know we've had a, a certain number of age 100 or more users of of our computational language, and what I found interesting um, is you know I, I've seen quite a lot of people uh, you know I, I don't think. I mean, I like to think I'm, I'm becoming ancient these days and I like to think I can still learn a lot of new things, but I think it's really the case that, um, that it's not, you know, people say, oh my gosh, I can't learn this, I'm too old, I've, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nonsense. It's, um, and I've seen that in, in reality, so to speak, um, uh, plenty of times. Um, the people, uh, sometimes it, it, it's, it's really, uh, uh, there's nothing there's nothing gets fossilized in us that's like, oh my gosh, you can't learn this. Um, uh, but people have a tendency to say, oh, no, 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 you know, it's something sort of more, you know, intellectually different. It has to be learned only by the young. Um, I don't think that's that's true at all. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wrote this book about elementary introduction to Wolfram language, kind of aiming at the sort of kid uh, demographic. Um, it's turned out it's also been really useful, I think, to a lot of um, adults, uh, even quite technically sophisticated ones, because the main thing that is very well, there are many things about that book that are intended to be at a low technical level. For example, it doesn't assume any knowledge of math. It also doesn't assume any knowledge of kind of software engineering and sort of programming ideas and so on. Um, but uh, uh, you know, that, that's. Um, but it's it's an interesting question: at what stage uh, different kinds of um, uh, different kinds of things in computational thinking are are really uh, possible? I, I would say that in in my observation about sort of using Wolfram language and, and computational language with kids. Actually, I've really been amused many times because it's like once dealing with real world stuff, in many cases of geography or, or astronomy or whatever else. And sometimes I'm like, they understand perfectly well the computational language and they understand perfectly well how to structure things. And there's some piece of general knowledge that they just don't have. Um, and I think sometimes in, in modern times, you know, with the, with the sort of the emphasis in education on, you know, principles rather than, rather than facts, um, they, sometimes the facts are, really aren't there. And that's a shame because, you know, the facts are the things on top of which you can learn principles. And I think, uh, I think kind of the, the uh, oh my gosh, they didn't learn any facts. is just like, well, it all seemed easy to learn facts, but if you really don't feed kids any facts, they're not going to learn them. And um, so sometimes that's been more of a problem than it has been the understanding of the, the sort of the syntax of the computational language or, or even the slightly abstract understanding of what, what uh, computational language does. Okay, let's see. Uh, I need to go fairly soon here. There's so many questions, but these are a lot of very technical questions. I think, um, um, Uh, okay, Parmenides is talking about a progress in, in high temperature superconductors. That's interesting. Um, okay, let's let's carry it to cover this one. So we got a question here from Pranjul. What does it mean? Correlation does not imply causation. Okay, you hear that you hear that comment quite often. Okay, so 
let's say um, that, uh, what will be a good example here? Um, let's say that you have something where, um, um, black cats, it's a good example of this. Um, uh, well, let, let me explain the basic point. The basic point is something is, oh, there's so many examples. Why am I not thinking of one immediately? Um, um, something like left-handedness causes people to be more assertive, okay? That would be a, a hypothesis. I happen to be left-handed. Uh, the, um, okay, so you might say, this is a hypothesis. I think left-handed people are more assertive. And you might say, left-handedness causes assertiveness. Being, um, you know, because we might have observed Statistically, if we do surveys of people of you know how assertive they are and are they left-handed or not, then we might say the chance of somebody being we might say that of uh, of um, right-handed people, let's say twenty percent are assertive, of left-handed people thirty percent are assertive. So we might say from that, okay, then we conclude left-handedness causes assertiveness because after all, we've got more left-handed people are assertive. Okay, so, but, but that wouldn't really be a correct conclusion because it might be that something leads somebody to be left-handed, something leads somebody to be assertive, and those things might be correlated, they might be happening together, but it isn't the case that left-handedness causes assertiveness. Um, it's just that they both come from the same cause. Now, actually, it might be more likely that assertiveness causes left-handedness because if people can be like, well, you know, which, which hand are you going to pick up the pen? And well, you have a slight preference for the left hand, but somebody else is telling you because most kids are right-handed, oh, pick up the pen in the right hand. And so if you're not assertive, you'll just pick it up with your right hand. And if you were only a little bit left-handed, you'll end up being right-handed. But the question is, is it the case that the, um, that kind of, you know, assertiveness causes left-handedness, left-handedness causes assertiveness, um, or are they simply correlated in the sense that they come together, perhaps from the same cause. Now, to take a much more extreme version of this, okay, let's take a, a, a curious hypothesis today uh, in, the, in the time of a pandemic. So here's a, here's, a, here's a statement. So we could say in this time of a pandemic, um, well, here's, here's a very extreme one, okay? You might say that uh, people get sick because somebody transmits the virus from one person to another, okay? And so people who are, you know, hanging out together, one person will get sick, the other people will also get sick, and that's because one person is transmitting, is causing the other people to get sick by transmitting the virus to them. Okay, so that's hypothesis number one. When you, if you observe the facts that people who hang out together get sick at, at you know, at more or less the same time, that will be a potential hypothesis. Okay, so another quite different hypothesis would be, oh, the virus managed to get everywhere in the world. Everybody's got a small level of virus in them because the virus is just, you know, just spread all over the place. But most people don't get sick most of the time because their immune systems fight off the virus. And it's only when for some reason their immune system is not as active that then suddenly they erupt and, and actually the virus can replicate and they suddenly get sick. Okay, so then we would have the hypothesis that maybe that it isn't the case. Maybe we're just completely wrong that the virus is transmitted person to person. Maybe instead the virus has successfully, you know, infected everybody at least a little bit. And what really matters is the internal, you know, immune system of each person and can the virus, you know, get, get up, um, uh, replicate itself without getting knocked down by the immune system. And then maybe it's the case that the people who are in the same environment, their immune systems or whatever it is that causes this, uh, you know, maybe they uh, are in a place where, I don't know, uh, it's very cold or, or it has or whatever, some other effect 
that can affect their immune system or some other aspect of them. And maybe all those people who live in the same house or whatever, they all get sick at more or less the same time. And they're all getting sick because there was something outside, you know, the temperature went down, their heating broke, who knows what else. And, um, uh, and that, and, and, they, and, they were, and they all got sick then. And so the, the, um, the, that would be a case where sort of there's, there's correlation, they're getting sick because they're all in the same place. They're not getting sick because one of them causes the others to get sick, so to speak. And um, so I think the, the, um, that's a, no, you know, that hypothesis is probably not correct. Um, although it's interesting to try and uh, you know, prove that that hypothesis isn't correct. And that's really an example of, um, of uh, sort of what's the difference between things are merely correlated, they merely happen together versus one thing actually caused another thing. And usually, you, know, you, can, you can try and do experiments. If you can do a controlled enough experiment to say um, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that where, where you could do the, the controlled experiment to ask, if you remove this, this, this thing, do you not get this other thing? That will be sign of a causation of one thing causing another thing, but but quite often you can't do a controlled experiment. I mean, when you have questions about you know the Earth's climate, you know we've only got one Earth. We can't really do experiments, although actually this time of the pandemic has been a fairly fascinating experiment from that point of view because uh, a bunch of things have changed in the world and we'll be able to see the effects of those on all sorts of global aspects of things like climate, uh, which will be very interesting and see what actually matters and what doesn't. It will give us a little bit more clue about that. But um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's again, when you only have sort of one instance to, to go with, it's very hard to do a controlled experiment where you say, switch this off. Does that mean that this other thing doesn't happen? Switch this on, then the other thing happens. What also makes that kind of experiment more difficult is, and this happens in a lot of kind of uh, medical uh, testing scenarios, it's, it's not that big an effect. Like if you, you know, 5% of people would have gotten better anyway. So the question of whether if, if when you give them the drug, uh, you know, 12% of people get better, then, you know, it, it's, a, it's a somewhat small effect. It's not like nobody gets better without the drug and, and everybody gets better with the drug. It's kind of a small effect. And that's where it gets much more complicated to trace through, you know, when you change what you did, how much of an effect does it have? So that that's um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking there are probably some really much better examples that I know should know well because I I run into this correlation versus causation thing so often because it's such a common kind of uh, thing where people say you know everybody who is um, uh, what's a great there must be good examples of this it's like uh, you know didn't you know that people who do this have that happen to them or whatever. And, and you realize it's like, um, uh, um, uh, you know, people uh, that you realize that, that there is some, there's some common cause to those things. It's not like the, one of those things causes another thing. I mean, it, it would be like saying, um, uh, gosh, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here on, on great examples. And it's so frustrating because it's one of those kinds of things where, where um, this is a, one of those quirks of human memory, or at least mine, that it's one of these things where it's so common that one runs into these things. And yet, um, and yet it's kind of, I don't index things by, oh, that's a correlation versus causation um, issue. Uh, so, um, okay, I need to run off, but, but there's a question here. One last question. Uh, uh, give an example of what, what I would do with Wolfram language if I were 13 years old. Well, it depends what I'm interested in. When I was 13 years old, I was really interested in physics. And um, uh, you know, I tried to program a computer to do some things to do with uh, sort of hard spheres bouncing around. I would do that with Wolfram language and it would actually work in a way that it didn't uh, back when I was programming an incredibly primitive computer to do it. I would also probably, I myself, would also probably do a bunch of sort of mathematical experiments of uh, you know what happens if it would have a very simple mathematical system or very simple computational system, what does it do? I mean, I personally have, have liked doing those kind of experiments all my life. For another kid who's like, well, you know, might be likes making music or something, 
they might say, well, what happens if I make a random series of notes? That's kind of a half line program, a very trivial program to just make a, a random series of notes and see, you know, what does that sound like? Okay, let's let's make the notes be correlated so that we're randomly picking whether we go up or down rather than having each note be random. What does that sound like? What does it sound like if we have uh, if we have chords there, you know, between um, between we're playing two notes and, and a chord and so on, and we go through a progression of chords, those kinds of things. That might be be one thing. Or if I was interested in um, um, in something like um, oh, I don't know, uh, geography. Maybe I would, or maybe maybe if I was interested in sort of world affairs, um, maybe I would be looking at um, uh, things about countries and you know GDP per capita in countries and comparing them with uh, I don't know number of people who go to school in those countries and things like that, and trying to see what I can understand about the world from that. Um, or perhaps if I was interested in um, uh, what other kinds of things, you know, if I was interested in in um, um, Making a um, uh, uh, making art, for example, I might um, uh, might try and um, uh, use uh, machine learning uh, capabilities to say, you know, take this photograph and style it in the style of some particular artist, or see what I could do with with making um, uh, sort of uh, automatically generating various kinds of artistic things, or maybe figuring out. Uh, if I was trying to make uh, some website, maybe I'd be interested in making some website that does something. Maybe I'd be making an interest in making a website that does some, I don't know, mathy thing like converts numbers to binary or, 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 or does, um, or maybe takes some, um, uh, something like that. I might um, make, um, um, uh, be able to, you know, create that by deploying it to the cloud. Or maybe I'd be interested in, in human languages and I'd be curious about, um, uh, you know what what kind of commonality there is between the words for something in different human languages. These are all things that that are easy to do with our computational language because sort of the, the the computational intelligence that's built into it. These are all things that are readily accessible to to uh, uh, a thirteen year old who who learns even a, a fairly elementary amount about about Wolfram language. Um, and I think that the um, uh, um, and, and really, what's what's really great about these kinds of things is, okay, you have one of these questions, you're curious, you know, is the word for fish, you know, what different first sounds are there in the word for fish in all the languages of the earth? And is that correlated with location on the earth? And is it, you know, is the language for, is the word for fish uh, somehow different or maybe shorter in languages that come from coastal areas of the world rather than languages that are inland in the world. I don't know, something like that. But, but you know, you just start generating these questions. And the trick is to get to the point where when you come up with a question, you're fluent enough, literate enough with computational language that you can just go and answer that question. You can say, I'm curious about this. I'm, I'm reminded I happen to be looking at something one of my, uh, what my kids um, did a few years ago um, he's done lots of kinds of, uh, it happens to be somebody who got fluent at age probably 11 or so um, with Wolfram language and is like, you know, just can 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 do computation on that thing. I was just looking this morning for random reasons at uh, a random thing where he was looking at aircraft safety data. There's some database out in the world and he's like, just imported the data from this aircraft safety database. And the question is, which is the, the least safe airline? I'm afraid the answer by a huge factor is Aeroflot, the former Soviet um, national airline is just, just uh, you know, that, that's a, um, a hugely less, less safe than, than other airlines, but it's a, it's a huge factor. But that, that's something that, you know, it's like if you're curious about that and you're curious, you know, how, how does that, how, what is the ranking of that? How has that gone over time? Well, if you're fluent with computational language, it's like, tap, 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 you know, 15 minutes later, you've got some information about that. Um, and that perhaps is information nobody has really had, uh, you know, in the past. And um, that, that's the kind of thing that sort of curiosity leads to curiosity when you have the possibility of using computational language as your kind of way of answering questions. You know, you come up with a question, you answer it with computational language, that generates probably five more questions and you go answer them. I think that kids do not have the idea that they can answer questions that have not been answered before. 
but this is this is a place where you know thanks to all the work we've done to try and build this computational language build the computational intelligence into it one does have the the opportunity to like answer questions easily answer questions that nobody has has answered before maybe probably nobody has asked them before and that's that's really an empowering thing to do and and as i say i think my my general theory is people people start with a certain natural curiosity and a natural propensity to to ask more questions more questions more questions and um, they often get the idea in school oh there's only a certain amount of knowledge you know there's this particular track of knowledge that you have to go down and you can't learn that unless you've learned this and this and this beforehand and so on but i don't think it's really true and i think that what we're doing with sort of computational intelligence and so on is really leveling that that playing field we're making it possible for for you know for kids to learn new things to which haven't ever been learned by anybody before rather than just oh there's this very specific path um that you have to learn everything along all right i think we've we've run out of time here um always a always a pleasure to uh uh to chat with people here and um thank you for all these questions and i i um um uh i'd encourage uh maybe we can segment this i think there are three categories here there's sort of general questions which are sort of perhaps of interest to everybody there are more technical more physicsy questions um uh, that uh, maybe i can break off in a separate um i've been doing kind of a monthly uh q and a about our physics project and that's probably the right venue for some of these more more technical questions um and then there's some questions about history and i i've been saying for a while and i i need to get around to doing it that i'd be happy to do some history q and a's um i mean i i i for better or worse i i i i know a fair amount about the history of science and technology and and um uh, at least for the last 40 something years there's a decent chance that i was sort of uh, uh that i have first hand knowledge so to speak um rather than um just knowledge from from studying the history uh in in um uh you know from a distance so to speak so um uh those are but i'm 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 um, i particularly uh encourage here um kind of uh questions about sort of how things in the world doesn't have to be physics it can be biology engineering even mathematics and so on i i i from uh you know try me out here i'm uh, i mean part of my objective is that um uh i think i don't know we can we can go back and see but but i think i've been getting better at explaining things as i've been uh doing this every week um and um so for me it's it's interesting to probe into different areas where i haven't really had to explain stuff much before ever um and uh um give me uh give me a try um uh, it's interesting for me and hopefully it will be interesting for you all all right i should sign off here now thank you very much 